Okay, so I just thought I'd uh, uh, give a bit of a summary of what the tech line is. I know a lot of people haven't had memory of it or uh, have heard of it since. Uh, it was, I'd say, the, it was on a transition in the computing industry from the time when people were first learning about microprocessors and learning about and looking at things from an electronics perspective towards it becoming a uh, a computer, a, con a commodity. Everyone's got a computer now. So uh, as Mark said, it was his first uh, computer. I would say that my prototype work that I was doing in the late 70s and early 80s uh, culminated in my first computer as well. So I actually had to build my first computer. And that's the real difference. Once we get to, say, 1984 or something, there's a bit of a phase trying to change and we get, you know, people growing up with computers, gaming becoming a big part of their childhood, getting into software, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's what makes this an interesting transition from my point of view. The tech one is kind of like the end of an era, uh, but it's an interesting era as well and not always talked about. So what is the tech one? The tech one is this. This is the original production one. It's, uh, it's been restored recently by Ken Stone, who's my partner in, in this in this crime uh, and it was uh and basically ken and i designed this uh it started as i say from prototypes that were completely done um, by myself uh, i grew up in the same street as ken Ken and i grew up in the same suburb and we shared a lot of projects in the in the lead up we were into cb radio we were into this we were into that the sorts of things kids were into in the 1970s um and then uh it just happened to be we also grew up in a neighborhood that where this, this TV repairman guy called Colin Mitchell mm -hmm. also started a magazine in his garage that ultimately became his extension and produced a magazine, which was as significant as your Sydney bloody magazine, right? Because <laughs> everything before that was all in Sydney, EA and ETI being, yeah, I mean, seriously, we were just consuming all of that stuff and then talking electronics just sort of opened up in our neighbourhood. So it was an interesting uh, transition because it meant that all the things that, I'd been working on basically Ken became an employee of Colin and after doing a number of issues we can talk about talking electronics um, and this is sort of jumping ahead so I'm going to start my presentation in a sec but you know here's examples of talking electronics going back to I forgot to back to issue five that's when I started to notice it but you know it ended up comp you know and talking electronics had that classic kind of you know DIY really uh, inexpensive but also focused at a very young market teenagers people that who remember the tech one uh, better than most tend to be about 55 because mm -hmm. they were five years younger than me I'm in my 60th year and uh, this is what I was doing at the end of my teenagehood and then a bunch of kids coming into teenagehood this is just a really uh, specific moment and that's uh, but, you know, we got the first colour page, you know. <laughs> Colin to this day swears it was a waste of money <laughs> and it didn't sell any more issues. But I tell you, it, it, it safeguarded the Tech One's legacy because if it had been on that kind of front cover, you, it might not have sold as many kits. So that's probably the, the main reason. So I think he's probably wrong, but <laughs> I respect that. He only ever did two colour issues, uh, front covers. And 11, was that? Right? Yeah, and 11. That's exactly right. So 10 and 11. So I've got to leave them here somewhere. Sorry, haven't got it right here. Um, it's over here. There we go. Number 11. So, yeah, so basically we're talking about the 40th anniversary of the Tech One. There's been a flurry of activity, as you might expect, for the 40th anniversary, as in somebody saying something in January, like maybe we should do something. And, you know, <laughs> by July, well, actually, by March, actually, but yeah, March. Uh, by July, start to get you know, requests for interviews and all sorts of things start to happen. But... So we're suddenly getting a very accelerated last bit, October, November, we're having a number of events. Uh, I did an interview with uh, Stephen Pass and, uh, and, and uh, Carl von Moller, who did the State of Electronics uh, interviews, which you might have seen on YouTube. Um, and both of them have done a lot of computer history style documentation. The documentary was... Nothing was shown. Nothing was shown. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, you have to duplicate the... Uh, that might be, um, yeah. Oh, oh mirror. Thank you. Thanks for telling me how to use this. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, screen mirror. Um, 
Okay. So maybe if we can just drag the. Well, you can do that. But yeah, right click on the desktop and you should have preferences. Or... Yeah. You might come over here now. Yeah. I haven't done that to this sort of thing. So, That's good, that's good, that's good. All right, so then. Mac tech support. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I only, I've been using Mac for about five years, but yeah, devices, devices, devices. Okay, so I just need to get back to my browser. Okay, so that was a bit of an accident, the hairdresser. I said, go for a number one, and then ended up looking like this old, old guy. So, <laughs> he looks all right, he's can sport it. You know, everyone else can sport it pretty well. <laughs> but for me, I was kind of like, wow. You know? um, so, whereas Ken always looks like that. So, um, basically, in 1983 was when we published. It was in February, March was the publication date. Talking electronics helpfully never puts a date because it means you can leave it on the newsstand for more. For longer, exactly. Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, because you know, news agents would do stuff like cut corners out and send them back, and all these things. Um, anyway, so dates are always a little bit. So we had to reconstruct these dates because uh, that was a big sort of uh, part of the story. Is how a lot of this went out of our memories for a while. There's Ken. Um, that's around twenty years old. So just a little bit after when he lost the stash. <laughs> yeah, and there's a. Yeah, he's, he's sitting on a car there as well. And uh, that's me back in those days. Handsome yeah, curve. Handsome, exactly. That's what we look like nowadays. We can't, <laughs> we can't help that. So um, anyway, uh, so let's travel back to another year. So this is a, uh, you might remember this movie. <laughs> so we're just going to go back. to So imagine a, um, a time before teenagers had computers. So just think about that for a minute. Teenagers without computers. Um <laughs> Yeah, imagine there was no internet. Well, clearly there was nothing to do. And we just used to sit around like this, um, just waiting for things. Only someone would get it. <laughs> and phones looked like that. And uh, Googling looked like this. That's true. And entertainment looked like this. And, you know, some of it was pretty good, but most of it was that. Right? So, um, and that's what we looked like. And. Uh, no, this is not. This is just some people I found on the internet. And I thought, yeah, that's, that could have been. Uh, and that's what food looked like. <laughs> <laughs> so, and gaming looked like this. Um, well, that's the generation I remember going to Luna Park, our Mel Melbourne Luna Park, which is older than this. Uh, and it, uh, and they would have arcades, penny arcades, which all mechanical, like literally little metal things coming up and ding, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a lot of actually charming machines that I presume don't exist anymore. They were they were a lot of fun in their own way, but but gaming just started, and Pong, of course, was really a sensation. And I, I love this because it had no computer in it. It's all digital, digital electronics, just gates scanning scanning the uh, the video signal. A, a, a amazing thing, uh, and this. Which, admittedly, as I say, is still cool. Anyway, you look at it. Gra vector graphics is still one of my favourite sort of ways of doing uh, doing graphics, and it was one of the earliest video games. Uh, was Space War, which I haven't got a shot of, but this one's Asteroids and Lunar Lander. So you know, this is the era, Melbourne, nineteen seventy eight, uh, when trans used to look like that. Um, but you know, it's a, the Australian scene in general. We're talking about the magazines which we were watching, uh, reading. Um, you know, I just moved from Mad magazines, <laughs> let's say DC Justice League of America, to Mad magazine, to CB Radios, CB Australia, to Electronics Australia, because I was starting to actually understand what they were talking about. All these TV repairmen, stodgy TV repairmen, talking about a dry joint on this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was still very grown up. Those magazines were pitched at adults, and so they had a slightly different focus. They were 
pictures of people like us, um, but there wasn't pictures of the kids when I was a kid at the time. So, okay, so this is where I grew up in Cheltenham. This is a shopping centre there. It doesn't look like that now. It's it's metastatised into its massive complex, which has actually jumped across the major highway. It's now on both sides and it's spreading. It's still growing. I mean, I'm concerned about it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but this is the version that won the 1968 Design Award and it was very contained. And, uh, um, and the other thing, an institution in every suburb, on you know Station Street, whatever, start suburb, would be a... A Tandy Electronics. Yep. And while at the time we used to sort of disregard it as, you know, the, the, the real Schmidt stuff was Dick Smith and, uh, and then, you know, ultimately people like Robert Irving and all those other, uh, ones. Tandy was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. And it, it, it introduced me to computing. It introduced me to basic programming language. It introduced me to, uh, even though the components, the Archer components were relatively expensive. <laughs> Uh, and not good value. There was this 8080 microprocessor sitting there for the entire time that store was there. <laughs> Nobody knew what to do with it. I was so tempted to buy it, but I had reasons not to. How much was it? Probably quite a lot. It was quite a lot, yeah. yeah. And there were support chips you had to buy as well. Yeah. Um, it would have been, it couldn't have been too much because it was sold in a candy store, yeah. but I just didn't think it was the, the right thing to buy. Um, so, 20 to $30 is in, in my rec recollection. So just to set some context, what was going on, I'm just going to do a little quick history of, of microprocessors and that sort of stuff. We'll just quickly go through this. I know you guys probably know all of this, but uh, we start with the military industrial complex. <laughs> because where does this stuff come from? Where does Silicon Valley come from? Um, we can also talk about the moon landing. We can also talk about the invention of software engineering. And that woman there, um, Margaret Hamilton, coined the word software engineering so that the administrators would start treating the programmers like engineers instead of secretaries. Uh, most programmers in those days were women. And it was a, um, and she invented the term software engineering as a way of giving some status to this mysterious kind of stuff that, that, that people programming were doing that the admins and the hardware people didn't understand or appreciate. Um, so Silicon Valley, like I say, all of this investment went particularly into California, uh, around San Francisco area. Intel was born in that area. This guy, Federico Fagan, or Fagani, I believe, he, he used to, he came from Italy, immigrated to the US. He worked for Olivetti while he was in Italy, went across to Fairchild, and then went to Intel. He is the, the guy who invented the NMOS uh, silicon chip fabrication and was responsible for the 4004, the 8008, and the 8080, and the Zeta, uh, when he went off into his own. So just passing through here, the Intel 8008 was an attempt to put on a chip what was already being done with TTL logic, uh, a serial uh, computer, which meant it only processed one at a time. 18 pins, really. Yep. yep. Um, and they, that would be one of many chips, though. So there's, there's a 4004, 4001, 4002, 4003. You had to have all of them together to, to get it together. But CPU is the 4004, uh, which is what led... To, sorry, now we're in the 8008, but that 4004 started. So this one, I don't know a whole lot about the 8008 other than it emulated the instruction set of this existing TPL serial computer, which was called the data point 3300. Intel were desperate to get that uh, contract, but they couldn't make it as fast as the TTL logic. So the company eventually walked away from the deal but left intellectual property with Intel. So Intel owned the instruction set, which they then expanded and revised and, uh, and turned into the 8080. Uh, here's the register set of the 8080. It's basically, you know, it's got an accumulator register. It's got BC pair, register pair, DE register pair, an HL register pair representing high and low musical pointer arithmetic. Looks familiar. It looks familiar, but it looks like a subset of what you're familiar with. And uh, the other problem with the 8080 was that it was hard to use. And like I say, I didn't want to buy it, the one that was sitting there in Tandy um, store, because I knew that I needed to have an 8224 and an 8228 as well. One was to, had something to do with the handling the clock cycles internally, all those M code, you know, M cycles and things like that. And I can't even remember what the 8228 is, but I think it's handling the input and output um, aspects. 
but you couldn't build an ADA system without it. And the other things is it needed positive 12 volts, negative 5 volts, positive 5 volts. And uh, you got to look at it from my perspective as a teenager going, I can barely get this stuff going. Everything was about barely being able to get the job done. <laughs> and that is really the history of the tech, is the minimum uh, that could be done. Uh, then I happened to come across in the tent store, released under the Radio Shack, uh, I think I'll come back to this, but it was written by a guy called John Titus. And he was the guy who published the first uh, computer kit in uh, radio electronics based around the ADA microprocessor. Uh, electronics Australia thought they had the world record because they brought out the Educate at exactly the same time that it was a TTL based serial computer designed by Jameson Rowe, but they missed it by a month and they weren't using a CPU. They were, as they weren't using a microprocessor, they were using the old, the older stuff. So they missed the timing and Radio Electronics got it. But it wasn't that big a deal. It wasn't a big success, that one. But the thing that followed it only six months later was the Altair 8800, which, of course, we know basically kick-started the whole microcomputer revolution as basically kids suddenly dropped their day jobs and they started to to target this machine. So everything started happening. The MITS computed in Albuquerque. And um, uh, so... Uh, Another thing's happening in, uh, this is, uh, very much of the times. Computer live. You can and must understand computers now. <laughs> and that was, that was published by a guy called Ted Nelson, who's better known for inventing hypertext, i.e. the World Wide Web. Although he's remained a critic of the World Wide Web for its entire existence because they see they didn't implement half of the ideas that he had for it. But the whole idea of hyperlinking documents is invented by this guy. And he was also popular, wrote this book, The Popularized. At a critical moment, this consciousness was happening about getting into computing. So just moving forward a little quicker, this is the paper roll that the Microsoft, the very first version of Microsoft Basic, as these guys printed out what they emulated a Altair 8800 uh, um, on a PDP-11 or something. They just basically simulated, wrote the basic programming language, flew to Albuquerque. Better call Saul, and uh, and then put the tape into the machine and uh, played it into the Altair, and it worked. Um, and that's why we now have Microsoft stranglehold on our lives ever since. Um, just that, but there's there was already inklings of opposition, and that was Tiny Basic, which was written. Although it's copyrighted as twenty nineteen seventy six, it came out around the same year, nineteen seventy four. And I just love the copyright on this one. Copyleft. Yeah, copy left. All, All wrongs we do. <laughs> And it was basically a direct comment on Bill Gates trying to, you know, maintain his copyright. Because um, copyright was a very shady area in the 70s. It didn't really, uh, they really didn't have a, a strong idea what software was. It wasn't until the 80s before we got actual concepts of software. When you start having to sign, you know, when you tear open this, this, this paper envelope, you agree to a end user license agreement, all that stuff right, hadn't been it. worked out yet. You know, this stuff was still free for you could basically copy everybody's stuff and not go to jail for it. Um, yeah, so Fagan, he goes off and uh, founds Zilog, and that is uh, where he basically basically takes all the ideas that he's had because his problem with Intel was he just thought the company had no vision. They were a RAM company. They made memory and they did microprocessors, but like many of those corporate, those, those Silicon Valley companies, they didn't see that the CPU was the business. Intel did learn, but mm -hmm. mainly when mm -hmm. the Zilog ate their lunch, mm -hmm. and they but they didn't let it, it they didn't uh, they they learned very quick uh, and got back into it as you know. <coughs> uh, so here's our heroes, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, there's Steve Wozniak and the other guy, I forget his name, <laughs> and <laughs> Paul <laughs> Allen, and, yeah, and uh, so we just we'll go on this, um, and the other guy. <laughs> um, okay, meanwhile. Back in Australia, the mini scan, as I say, EA, they didn't succeed with the educate, they got back on the horse and they made the mini scan, which if you've ever tried to read the instruction set of. It's, uh, I know the retro computer people, I better be careful not to insult anybody because somebody will have dedicated significant time on that, um, on the National Semiconductor CPU. Um, but when I read the data book in my, when I read the data pages, 
um, out of my trusty Adam Osborne 1977 edition uh, introduction to uh, uh, to microcomputers by Adam Osborne, some real products. You can see it's well it's well thumbed around the Z80 section, and unfortunately, Adam Osborne published a beautifully bound uh, or beautifully printed because all of Adam Osborne's books are shiny and they I mean they don't look so great now, but they they're shiny and really high quality type type setting. But he didn't know anything about how to bind an encyclopedia <laughs> like that. But I know that there was a second version of this that came out the following year, which turned this into a two volume set. So there was so there was a bit of learning that went on. Um, so the National Semiconductor SCMP microprocessor came out, and James and Rowe, Jack on the horse, uh, does a 500 no 256 byte RAM uh, computer that no ROM. Because why would you need a ROM when you can bootstrap it with the binary switches at the beginning, right? So you can go click, 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 deposit, click, click, click. So you've got to do the address lines and you've got to do the data lines. You put in a certain amount of code, that bootstraps the program, and then it can start reading from paper tape or some other mass storage device where you can actually uh, load the program. But this is a standard process in computing right up until, uh, like Ben Grimmett, uh, one of the t uh, club members uh, of the Tech One group mentioned that while he was in the Navy, they were still doing that for some of their um, some of their boats in the in as recently as the late noughties. They were still bootstrapping that way. Basically, something you get the apprentice to do. You know, you wouldn't. Uh, hey, son, you know, you bootstrap the computer, will you? It won't take you too long. Um, so th the first time I saw, I actually saw one of these. One of my teachers had one of these uh, yeah. physics teacher. Uh, and so the, I obviously sold quite a lot, but to kids, and I think Mark can give the story, but basically I'm just going to quote Mark and just say that he saw one of these things and was not impressed. <laughs> However, the person who was clearly programming them and getting the lights to do stuff was having a ball. Mm -hmm. It's just it's hard to communicate to non-technical or, or, you know, outsiders what's going on. The tech one is just at the level where you can at least play a tune. People get that. Um, the other thing that happened around that time, 1977, we're talking about here, TRS-80 comes out, Apple II, 1978, Blondie, uh, back to Melbourne. So as I say, the tandy store, back to the tandy store. I just started at this particular moment, we're talking about a period when, you know, I started to get very involved and interested in digital electronics, uh, but I hadn't really discovered microprocessors yet. But I was learning all all of these all of these things, you know, counters and multiplexes and so on. I read everything by Forrest M. Min. Oh, you the third. Yeah, yeah, you know him. Yeah. And you will see, and uh, as a controversial, not very controversial, I don't think, a statement that there's a lot of the spirit of talking electronics, including this yeah, this engineer's that. paper, um, comes from the books that were published by uh, Radio Shack Tandy. Uh, from that time, that very first person kind of, you felt like you knew this guy and he was, seemed very knowledgeable and he wrote, and he did a lot of hand driven, hand drawn, um, diagrams just like this. So I think, and I'm, I know Colin really liked this. So the book I was talking about is the 8080 bug book. And this really set me down the path of, okay, digital electronics is great, but I, can't imagine building an actual computer out of digital electronics, but this chip looks like it's the go. So just going back briefly to the 8080. And the other thing in the context of the Tandy stores was, of course, the the way Dick Smith was ubiquitous in the, in our industry. In, in, in the electron, anyone who was involved in electronics uh, knew Dick Smith. He's a household name now, but it's all for... Australian Geographic, it's for aviation, it's for all everything. He never talks about electronics. Um, and it's fascinating because he was just, he was he was this guy who was behind the Exidy Sorcerer, the System 80, the this, the that. Everything that sort of happened in the Australian computer industry had a big boost because of Dick Smith. Um, uh, so as I say, coming back to the Adam Osborne book, the bit that really, uh, so that's volume one, this is volume two. These were sold to Dick Smith. Uh, I heard for the first time about the ZX80. And at this point, I went, okay, it's, it's two 8080s, basically. It's got two sets of registers. 
It's got these other additional registers, IX and IY. It can automatically refresh dynamic memory, whatever that is. <laughs> like I knew about it, but I was always looking for static stuff because I couldn't manage the whole idea of a dynamic memory. Uh, Z80 CPU, it was a lot simpler and it only used five volts. And its clock system was super simple. Uh, so there was a lot of simplicity about the Z80. I could see, I could go ahead with that. So like I say, Z80. <laughs> um, so that's when the prototype started. And uh, my uh, very ever patient father would take me to all these stores. And when I think back now, he invested a lot of money. He never bought me a computer, which is what he, if he could have done, he could have put an end to the whole thing. But because <laughs> he's an engineer as well, a mechanical engineer. And, you know, so his idea would be popular mechanics, not popular electronics. But... Yeah, obviously he could see what, what I was doing and uh, it, it was the only way it could have possibly have happened. Why, what, why the ending? It was a play on Apple. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think about it, there were a lot of things. There were apricots and there were this and that. There were a lot of fruit and vegetable related uh, <laughs> uh, things. But yeah, so it's just a bit of teenage humor in a way. So the kind of books I was consuming, um, I haven't I haven't relocated my a version of the, the William Barden book, which is the Z80 Microcomputer Handbook. But I did bring along the Z80 Instruction Handbook, which is a really great little book. Hard to get. There's only two in existence that I know of. Mark's got the other one. Right. Um, this is the original of mine, but this is the one that I lent Colin and, and to Ken, and they photocopied. Oh, am I like to say? Yes. <laughs> and basically, they, they, they have a big wad of, uh, they rely heavily on on this as well. The makeup yeah. purposes for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the original witness it was a knowledge transfer, but yeah. ultimately I left the book around there for a really long time. Um, I didn't get to the Rodney Zacks book at this during this time, but I subsequently went back and read it. In fact, I used it to remind myself when I started to do a bit of retro computing, which is a bit more recently. So getting back, you know, there's a few weird choices that I used in my, my, my prototype. One of them was this 8212 Intel chip. I literally, you can blame Adam Osborne for that on page <laughs> so and so because I thought that's how you do parallel. So, you know, subsequent versions, I think it was the Tech 1B or was it the 1A? It's the 1A, which replaced the 8212 with the uh, 7273, uh, much more logical choice and a lot cheaper. The um, And the other issue, as I mentioned before, is RAM that had to be static. All of the paraphernalia that's needed to, to deal with dynamic memory just was beyond my interest level. And so I always focused on static. The kind of static memory in those days was the 2102, and that was a that was a 1K by 1-bit chip. So you needed a bank of eight of them in order to get 1K. And so you'll see a lot of 1970s uh, experiments, uh, projects in EA and ETI using the bank of eight chips for memory, 1K. Uh, and the, the ROM of the, the era was a 2708, which was extremely hard, again, for a kid to program because it required high voltages and you had to cycle through the entire memory space until the, until the bits flipped. So I wasn't, I wasn't super keen about this, but I did program. I did actually send away some code to a mail order service that then, uh, hand entered my code, I mean, they deserved the money <laughs> into, it wasn't many bytes, but it, they basically burned it and said, bang, it didn't work. Uh, so mail order service wasn't really the thing, you know. And uh, so things were not quite right. And then the next thing was, and you see Archer here has got the 2114, which is another uh, alternative, which was what I ended up settling on on the prototype, which was that's a 1K by 4-bit chip and use two of them, you get 1K. So that was fine. It was these to run really hot those chips. Um, then along comes the two seven sixteen, which anyone can program. You can write a programmer for it. It's not that hard. It's just you know put a voltage into it, and you only have to program it once. So I was hooked on that, but they were fairly expensive at the time. So just a little bit of a little side thing. I don't know whether anyone remembers the two seven five eight. It was a 1K <laughs> ROM because it was actually a 2716 that it had lost half of its side and then it would have a a little pin which they didn't actually tell you it was actually a pin which you would if it was a, a an A or a B you would either 
tie it high or you would tie it low, and that would give you the working path, you know? <laughs> I thought that was ingenious, and I believe they did that all the time. That was a sort of a standard way they dealt with defects. It's just a ship with a different number and, and, a, and an arbitrary rule. You just tie that bit high. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, um, to program it, I had to use binary switches. So back to the mini scamp kind of approach, although I had a little counter that would then increment the address. Um, so I always had to start from the beginning when I was doing this to make a ROM and hand assembly. So this is a real measure of what age you are as if you even know what that is. First off, if you've done assembly with an assembler, you would be using the equivalent of $5,000 worth of software and, mm -hmm. and incredibly expensive devices. So this became all possible with, say, Micro-V and so on a little bit later, but at this moment, hand assembly was really the only option. And so the first ROMs were all hand assembly. Uh, and then erased <laughs> with an extremely scary UV, medical grade uh, UV lamp, which would blast the ROMs back. And I set this up in a, in a cupboard. Ken was reminding me about this, but basically I put some cardboard in the inside and a bit of, sort of silver and stuff to kind of like internally reflect it, put the ROMs in there and sort of like leave the room, you know, <laughs> and um, come back. And then if you open the cupboard after that, this pong of ozone, mm -hmm. yeah. and it was, uh, yeah, it was a sterilization system basically, but done in an incredibly unsafe way. Uh, the the Sendvor 923, why did I use this? And this is a question I get a lot. It's a keyboard scanner chip, and if you look at the fact that we're talking about how hard it was for me to program the ROM, any bit of hardware support was welcome. So, my first prototype used this chip, which is a very exotic chip, hard to get, and is uh, still part of the tech one, but we are moving away from it uh, 40 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it made a lot of sense at the time, but probably shouldn't have gone into the tech one. And we had just two certain segment displays in my prototype. Then there's steric chloride and there's, um, yeah, all those kinds of things. So, so um, let's just go to talking electronics. Um, Talking electronics, as I say, had a real scrappy kind of DIY vibe about it. And if you go back and you read these issues, they're actually really well written and they're very packed with detail. They're not full of ads, in fact, there are no ads. And they're just wall to wall information. Uh, they took a lot of time to produce, which is why they came out so infrequently. Uh, and Ken and Colin uh, were the, the main stay of that, but Ken was producing all the classic. Um, Golden age um, of these, and uh, but it did go on until issue sixteen, and then unfortunately had to go. Um, sorry, sixteen was talked about. No, no. Tech Times. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Sorry, my collection doesn't go up that high because uh, yeah, I started doing other things by then. Uh, there's Colin Mitchell. That's a recent photo rather than a, an ancient photo of him from that time. Um, and there's Ken Stone, young man, uh, and I will see those. So anyway, the main point was Ken had been working at Talking Electronics for a number of issues and he said, it's time for us to do a computer kit. I uh, know just the person who can do it. So basically, uh, uh, we worked it out a sort of like a contract and I basically designed the tech one. I was never an employee of, tech, of talking electronics, but Ken was. And Ken took my prototype, which was rough as hell, and turned it into what you see today, which is, you know, kind of photogenic and has a nice vibe, which has continued um, for all this time. Uh, it had some design goals, which I think are all laudable things. Um, it wasn't pitched at adults. It was pitched to teach people about computers, which in practice meant children, but not children, teenagers, but it, it did teach a lot of young adults as well. Uh, it had to be easy, easy to understand and had to be low cost. It had to be below a certain amount. The kid ended up selling for around $80 back in 1993, mm. which is obviously a bit more than that today. <laughs> Originally, it was called ORAC because that's the kind of kids we were. And uh, But then Ken does come up with the, the name TEC1, the Talking Electronics Computer. Pretty, it's a no-brainer, but it's a good name. 
What is it a picture of? I can't recognise it. No, it's Aura. It's Aura. Ah, oh, I haven't. <laughs> okay, so there was a TV show from that sort of Doctor mm-hmm. Who vibe, BBC, and they did, it was called Blake's Seven. And it was, and ORAC was their lovable perspex box computer, which was, you know, did the wisecracking kind of, that kind of thing. It wasn't wisecracking, but it was, yeah, the Oracle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was an, he was an Oracle. That's where ORAC comes from. And it's, to me, it, it's not a very elegant design for a science fiction, but it is memorable. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, you have to be there kind of thing. <laughs> uh, one thing that came in that did make my life a little easier was that 6116 has started to become common. That's a really nice chip. It was CMOS, which meant very low power, unlike the 2114. It also, uh, you know, it, it was 2K. It was a 2K, um, 2K of memory and, and matched the 2716 kind of nice in symmetry terms. So it meant that we could ship a minimalist computer, which was 2K of RAM, 2K of ROM. Beautiful symmetry. Therefore, no need to ever decode any more address lines because who would ever need more than 4K? <laughs> uh, so that's the that's the thing. It also had very minimal, as I say, uh, a, uh, addressing logic, minimal decoding logic. It had uh, two ports, one for controlling the segments, one for controlling the cathodes on those uh, seven segments, and one bit used to control the speaker and one mystery bit, as, um, as Stephen points out, uh, which had no use at the time, but has since subsequently been used for Big Bang uh, serial input and output, and actually works amazingly. <laughs> uh, so you know, just quoting Einstein, everything should be as simple as possible, but not no simpler. And so that's what the tech one was, as far as I was concerned. After sort of looking at the stuff for about four years, this was the minimalist configuration that I could uh, imagine. So you can see this is the configuration. It's fairly familiar to anyone who's read the magazines. Um, basically, there's a, uh, that says a 2732, but it's actually 2716. This is a slightly updated version of it. It's got a 6116 2K RAM. It's got the 2716 2K ROM. It's got the CPU. It's got an oscillator uh, down here, which is a quirky little thing, another one of my contributions. Um, and, you know, decoder logic. And here's the other half of the circuit here. We've got seven segments, uh, sorry, we've got six uh, seven segment displays attached to a latch. This, this dot diagram has been updated again to include the, the newer uh, design. And also the Z4923 going to a, to a keypad. And yet, like very minimal support logic. Uh, one of the main innovations that Colin added to it was to make sure that I didn't just run this straight to ground. My LEDs were a little bit dark, and they were probably putting a, an unreasonable load on the um, on the CPU uh, or onto the latches, actually. So just putting some, just putting that row of transistors along there was a was a was a good thing. Uh, so just, when you said oscillator, was that for the radio or for the clock? For the clock, and it. Oh, I actually got it on the next page. It was a crappy little clock. It was literally a CMOS inverter. With a with a little bit of a delay line going on with a capacitor and a resistor. So no crystal. No crystal, no. and no. I had no idea what frequency it was coming out. <laughs> and it's only been relatively recently when I've actually measured it and actually gone and, and gone 100 kilohertz. <laughs> the amazing thing about the Z80 is it's a static chip, which means that it doesn't lose state no matter how slow the clock goes. You can get it right down. I've seen people where they literally push a button. Yeah, yeah you like, can use, yeah. you can single step it by just literally clock, using the clock line. You don't even need a fancy single step. Uh, and it works and it doesn't lose state. So that's a testament to it. But the, here it is. It's still shipped in every subsequent one because it enables people to play the early tunes and the games and everything at all. Have all been done on that timeline, but this is a four four kil four megahertz chip being pl- run at a hundred kilohertz because I didn't know how to design an oscillator. <laughs> Subsequent people have moved on to using crystals, and you can definitely run that thing at four four uh, megahertz, no trouble at all. So that's a sort of a quirk, but it's a charming thing. Everything about the tech one is charming <laughs> um, to to me. Uh, getting back to hand assembly and so on. Um, so. Basically, had to produce a, a monitor ROM that controlled. This is not my code, by the way. I just I, I don't didn't. Th- I wasn't sentimental in those days. I am now, uh, and so a lot of things got lost. Um, some of my notebooks, but just go with that idea that um, 
the monitor was something that could enable you to add and remove, uh, add items to a, a memory. Just go to a memory address and enter a value and then move on to the next value and also to jump and execute from that location. That's the only functionality that uh, that provides. And then added a few games, added a few tunes, added a few uh, little novelty uh, things to it, which we can we can bring up later during some demonstrations and so on. But right now, I'll just move on that. Um, so, you know, in the summer of 83, which means really December 82, uh, we had uh, a working prototype. And so then we got on to writing the magazine articles. And that was real, really fun too, because, and this is the only issues where you see a lot of cartoons in the issues. That made sense though. To a No, and because you see, coming out of the 70s, there were a lot of explainer books which were done as cartoons. It was the sort of style, 1970s. They were, they, you know, sort of the sort of a hippie generation, but they did it in technical books as well. There were a lot of cartoons even in, in technical things. So this is explaining to people for the very first time what a computer is. You can see here, this, this is actually a, a drawing done by Ken Stone, and this is uh, his, the CPU uh, is reading a, a program. He's got an input port, he's got an output port, and he's also got some RAM, which is a notepad, which is, he's using for a scratch pad, and there's a clock, <laughs> which doesn't really explain what the clock is doing, but I suppose it does in a way. And this, I did this picture, and this is another example. You can see the layout of the registers. You can see that there's an arithmetic logic unit to one side, the calculator, and you can sort of see that uh, the CPU is sternly looking at the program and changing the registers. Um, there are there are other bits to that, but you know we, we filled it up with lots of cartoons. So this is for a game called Twenty Three Matches or NIM. That uh, it's probably the, the most program. That, that, that's a vast sort of program to work to win. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, it actually was inspired. I was inspired by a basic program I saw in the candy store, which was called which was written for TRS eighty, and I was sick one day in bed, and then just wanted to solve that problem of how you could win 23 matches no matter what. And there is a simple trick, which I'm not going to give away. <laughs> uh, but I can beat you. Yeah. Uh, what if both players have the same strategy? Do you have uh, a stalemate? Yeah, it's a bit like, like it's like Norton Crosses. Yeah, always it, the, the person who starts always wins, ah, unless okay. they're known, which yeah. they nearly always are. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, if the other person can then just go, there's the point, and then they just jump in, and then it's then it's lockstep until the end of the game, and just you know. But it's one of those kind of games. Uh, um, but I still like it. I played with my kids. And we'd go to a cafe and get those sugar sticks, you know, <laughs> and sort of lay them out, and you know. Uh, so anyway, publication date February 1983, March 83. To be honest, I think it's one of those months. I have feeling it was February then. It still had a summer vibe, game, although March is pretty hot too. Yeah. Formula Clarks and Colour, as I mentioned, that was a big deal. It didn't last. It went back to black and white. Spot colour. Yeah. Yeah, spot colour, exactly. Uh, which was always with spot colour, but yeah. Uh, so, you know, so the, the fallout from that, thousands sold. You know, like, I think it's up to 2,000. Um, it was popular, lots of builds, and uh, was a big deal for a narrow segment of people. And there were subsequent boards. This is a me drawing in style of Mad Magazine uh, cartoonist Don Martin, who was my hero at the time, uh, if that knows. And um, and this is the 8x8 lead uh, display, which, you know, you can see these are the kind of peripheral boards that, and projects that came out in that era. And there's been a huge explosion of uh, things that have happened over that time as more and more people have come and discovered the, uh, the tech one because... So let's just sort of say that, you know, it was the introduction of computers to many people. It was uh, the first affordable computer for many people. It inspired many applications of the Z80 that weren't necessarily related to the tech one, but people got into the Z80 as a microprocessor. And it introduced me to many people over the years. And that's not, that's an underestimation of the number of people I met through this. The basic design inspired a lot of people to enter into hardware design. I've heard people talk about how they then got into microcontrollers. One guy said that he then worked on satellites, um, obviously not with Z80s, uh, but the fact that he got into hardware, this is through this. And then I've, I've got a friend who's used uh, used the Tech One as the basis for his art installations. He then went on to develop his own quite sophisticated 
he's built around the, the Conway's Game of Life idea, where he has a great big painted canvas. I wish I've got some video. I'll have to try and get some video one day. But what he did with pulse width modulation was just amazing. It's not just a boring game, game of life. It's the fact that he had the Z80 doing, doing all the fades and fades, which created a very organic kind of uh, very peaceful sort of uh, effect. Um, he since tried to do it with Arduinos and just can't get the speed out. And which these things are thousand, ten thousand times faster. I don't know, but using the tool chains, C and all this stuff, for whatever reason, he just says that he was able to do better. He was able to get this stuff happening in eight bit, and he was doing it in the early nineties, late eighties and early nineties. So anyway, the era ends quite quickly. By 1983, we move into 1984, and we start to talk about commercial stuff. Of course, there was always the, already the Sinclairs, Sinclair ZX80, ZX81, and then the Sinclair Spectrum. We could also <laughs> talk about the Jupiter Ace and a bunch of other weird little British machines. The Americans got wind of it, Commodore business machines, took one look at the Sinclair and said, we have to kill them. So that's where the VIC-20 comes from, and that's where the Commodore 64, which did kill them, really, uh, comes from. But the adults had already moved on, and really, I mean, so did we. 16 bit was starting to become a thing. We were starting to talk about Macintoshes, we talked about IBM PC, and we talk about Amigas because clearly the, the kids wanted Amigas because the games were better. <laughs> and games were a thing by this point. So, a few moments later, so we're 35 years later, Ken gave me a call around. 2016, that they're about saying, you know, they're still talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and there's a there are people on Facebook, and there's this thing called retro computing, and they talk about them like they're antiques. And I'm going, what do you mean antiques? <laughs> 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 These things are new, right? You can always buy TTL. You can always buy oh, yeah, digital yeah. electronics, and they say, no, they're Chinese counterfeits, and yes. they're this, and they're that. And I'm going, wow, okay, all right, because my intervening time was I got involved in software, and so most of my work in the software industry, not the hardware industry. Uh, so, but yeah, it's fascinating because, uh, yeah, this was a this was an eye opener that computers now of our childhood had become collectibles, and that they, and that you know, not only were they going for nearly the same price as what they were new, they're going for significantly more. So, anyway, that was at the time when I started to visit. Uh, I went to Kent to visit Ken. I hadn't seen him for about fifteen years. At that stage, and we just started talking about that. And Stephen Justin over there, he started a group called the, the Tech One Z80 Computer Group, um, and that's where we go. We started a GitHub repository where all the classic software has been stored, and also all the new stuff as well. And it's been, and because we're now open source, we're not buy the magazine, or, you know, buy my kit, do this type of stuff. It's all open source because we're none of us are not doing any money. Anymore. So um, that uh, means the whole open source thing transformed um, hardware as evidenced by the Arduinos and all the explosion in, in these kinds of things. So in March 2023, we announced the start of the Tech One G project. There had been a series of, of models. There were the, the classic ones like the, 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 the A and B. I'm not quite sure about the story of the C. Does anyone know? That? <laughs> anyway, a little bit after my time. No problem. You go on. So that's that's a classic one. Then the D is where a guy called Ben Rumet um, did a uh, went to Colin, got permission, and started to produce the, basically that, that that last version of it again. And it was called the the Tech One D. There was uh, a board produced by Ken Stone called the One E, and there's a few boards in existence of that one. And then there's the One F by Craig Jones. And then the 1G was our attempt to rethink within the parameters of what the one tech one is. It has to be 100% backwards compatible, but it also has to deal with some of the, get rid of some of the short shortcomings, but also still run like the classic ROMs without being too complex. It still has to maintain a degree of buildability. Um, it is more complex than the original. Here's the original. And you'll see a built-up version, but here's the board. Um, it's got about twice as many support chips. It didn't use, it doesn't use um, FPGAs. It doesn't use anything uh, that's not period appropriate. 
So while there are much nicer key, keys than were available in the 80s, we understand what a switch does, whereas uh, all the chips are classic chips. So this is the UBI idea. It's got serial bit bang. It's got 32K of RAM. Uh, can be expanded up to 64K of RAM. Uh, it's got an LCD display as per some of the add-on boards that, that that board that uh, Jim Robinson, who I didn't mention, uh, added to this design in the later issue. Uh, 14 IO ports, QWERTY interface, uh, a, an expansion bus, which uh, Mark calls the Z80 bus, but basically it's the pins of the Z80. So you can really do anything you like with it. Uh, it could run CPM and uh, full-size keyboard available as well. Uh, there's that guy. <laughs> and so that's a made up one right there. And um, earlier in the month, as I say, we, we, had, we, we went to Ken's place. This is Ken's studio. <laughs> and Ken is got some fantastic <laughs> 90, 1970s uh, analog synthesizers. As a sideline after the tech one, Ken became really big in the analog synthesizer area. And that was something that he was doing around the year 2000. He had a whole business going. It was really, really big. But that, um, uh, that's what I'm going in that place. It's actually a lot smaller than that. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was a great backdrop for us to, to conduct an interview, which will be cut together and made into two documentaries coming soon. Uh, and there we go. Doing the two Ronnies. Um, <laughs> And, and so I haven't got photos of every single member of the, of the team, but we have Brian over here, and then I've just got Mark here. And then we're going to get a picture of Craig Hart, who's very elusive in photos. Yes. Yeah. And, and of course, Ian right here. And so Nick, oh, another photo of you as well. And, and James, who's, who's more recently into the, into the group. So, and I'll probably get more photos to just add to this. Um, but, you know, and here's a picture uh, with Colin. And Mark, and one thing that Mark did was, was basically talk to Colin directly about open source use of the design, not the idea of being locked down to some company that's going to supply you with one more board for as long as they feel like it, which is what drove me nuts about the Tech One was that it wasn't free and open source. So uh, after speaking to Colin, we got permission, and essentially the Tech One design, which I mean, I could have reproduced another one, but I wanted it to be a tech one and the copyrights and so on like that meant that we wanted to make sure that we had permission. And so it is open as a GPL project. So all of the stuff, which includes the Gerbers, which includes all the software. So you don't need to buy the boards from, from Mark, even though he's making a split. He's making a fortune of you guys. But, you know, I'm retiring. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, so in other words, that, that, just we want the thing to keep going. We don't want it to die out, which could easily happen if someone decided to get proprietorial about it. <laughs> Microbeat. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so that's that's my talk. Uh, is there anybody got any questions on on that? Yeah, how old were you in eighty three? By that point, I was nineteen, going on twenty. Yeah. So it was uh, and obviously natural. <laughs> yeah. That's why I gave it away after that, wasn't it? Yeah. I was trying to work out why I wasn't involved in hardware after that. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's right. Um, I, I considered myself 19, at the, yeah, I was 19 at the time, but I did turn 20 after the publication. Can you tell us a bit about the 8212s? Because yeah, obviously, if you get a 273, then mm. what was your thinking? It was literally just the idea, okay, I needed an 8-bit latch, and I'm looking through there, the clock timer circuit, you know, I don't really need one of those, and that's a serial IOUART, uh, and this is a parallel port. And it was programmed, one of the benefits of the 8212 is that each pin was programmed by keeping the input or an output. But, yeah, not great thinking, really, in the sense that I knew all the TPL chips. I had data books, and I was very familiar. How else could I have known the 923? I was, that was like at the back, you know, like I got all the way from uh, 7400 all the way to 93. <laughs> so, you know, that was the, the thing, but I don't know why. <laughs> but what's and, wrong? But why yeah. people keep asking that? Is there something fundamentally wrong with the 8212? It's expensive or? and rare and an Intel right. chip. It comes from Intel. And so it's it's microprocessor priced. It's, okay. it's comparable to a microprocessor, an 8080 support chip. I think it was quite a struggle, right? Mm, yeah. So it, no. it, it made a lot of heat. 
parent. Yeah, was, that's yeah. right. And it was probably from a different era in the sense that the thing about these things, we were doing this in 1983, the, the technology was had been designed in 1974 and the 886 came out in 1976. So if you're thinking about it, it takes a long time for this stuff to flow out. And it kept flowing because the Z80 stuff just kept going right through into the 90s. Uh, but, but yeah, that's real 1970s technology. And I was informed by my um, Adam Osborne published June 1977 data book, you know, so it was really just had to do with that. And, um, yeah, so I've, as like I say, I've got some books up here for anyone who'd like to have a look. Um, there's a few books that went on. The Talking Electronics did produce a lot of special edition type books as well. And Ken Stone wrote this one. It was uh, uh, Electronics for Model Railways. And in that, he shipped a, a special computer just for controlling train sets. And it had some wonderful little features like um, in the evening, the, um, the fluorescent lights in the streets of your train set would go bleep. <laughs> just like real ones and um that don't do that anymore um but things like that all little touches which were really nice um and that was an interesting and controversial chip uh, computer because it didn't have any ram and uh if anyone knows about the micro comp that's that's was the inspiration behind that aka the world's was it the world's most hated computer? Yeah. I called it a spike based development. <laughs> <laughs> um, as in it didn't need to exist because to me a computer has to have RAM. I know they had a lot of registers in there, but that's not RAM. But it is amazing it, it worked. Uh when I say spike based, I meant not from Ken. Ken built that in an original thought and he was just trying to do it as cheaply as possible. But the subsequent story of the microcom and why it existed. That's for another day. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you ever did a video about Ramless programming? Yeah. 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 I've got yeah. a microcomp here, but I, you know, I just keep it low. <laughs> 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 you can come up to me personally and I'll show you. <laughs> just show you. It's all water under the bridge, you know. That's, you know mm. but like I said before, we've got the Wombat, the Apple II phone, which oh, was yeah, yeah. eventually banned by Apple. You know, mm. We have the the chairman of Apple from the eight, uh, Apple Australia from the eighties was here and said, "Oh, I'd love to chuck that one back in the bin." But I mean, the thing is, by now it's mm. also oh, of course. it's worth having these things so that we remember the stories. You know, of course, it's, it's, it's no history, right? Now, just like, yeah, because people want to remember why why was it in mm. here? You know, because and yeah, like, it's, it's just worth having it in here so people can see it. Anyway. And then you can tell the story. Of it. Indeed, it's, for a lot of us, it's, it's history that we can really see. Mm. I have one question. Um, the DAT board, was that you or someone else? That was Jim Robinson. Okay. And uh, Jim came on a little after my involvement. So what happened after issue 11 is we basically, well, Colin didn't want to pay me any more money. So then I decided to um, do something else. Uh, so that meant I didn't have any involvement. But Ken kept working there. And so Mon 2 was written by Ken. And then subsequently Ken moved on as well. Uh, Jim, Jim Robinson was never an employee of Colin. He was, uh, con he had his, he owned the DAT board and I'm not sure how that worked, but maybe it was just a bit like my situation. It was probably a cash thing or I know that he gave Jim uh, a lot of advertising space and ability to sell his products within that, within that issue. Uh, so he wrote that and he also wrote JMON, which makes use of that. Uh, and that was, you know, the most advanced of the monitor ROMs up to that point. We now have a, more advanced one um but the point was that yeah jim who i've never met personally but i have spoken to uh through the internet um and is uh based in general i think um anyway uh he also donated the source code for jmon into the system the dat board then went on to become the basis on which we built it into the main board the the, the most important parts being the lcd display but also the bitbang uh serial so those things, you can do more sophisticated serial with a special UART chip. Um, we've got examples of that with the 6850. Uh, but you can actually do an amazing lot of normal sort of uh, uh, telecommunications using the Big Bang. And that the, DAT, the DAT board was the start of that. And he also added uh, tape, save and load, which we don't really care about. But, uh, yeah, there were several innovations that, that Jim brought to it. Because, again... Tech one was your first computer. 
and he was just that little bit younger. And so the next generation came through. And then, of course, the last of those was Craig Hart, who became an employee and an apprentice of Holland. And subsequently, uh, he worked with Jim. But that's kind of the story after Ken and my involvement. Yeah. So that's probably it. I'm happy to talk um, afterwards and coming up and take a look at some of these, these uh, books if you're interested in a bit of 70s uh, well, John, as stuff. A, uh, as a thank you for coming up here, it's a big effort. Um, I did actually get some special uh, special edition of the Tech One board uh, printed in matte black and gold and ink on there as well. So I want to present that to you. Thank you very much thank for coming you. up. Now, of course, there's minimums of those prints, of course, um, which I do actually have uh, number three and four here as well. While we're doing lunch, you'll get a raffle ticket for every Sanya that you buy. You get a raffle ticket or you can buy the raffle ticket itself. All proceeds are going to go to the ACMS, uh, you know, for putting this up and uh, the, the wonderful service that they, uh, they do. I, I really very much do appreciate what the ACMS are doing for the Australian computer history. Um, so that's one. And then the second one, we're going to have, a, if you don't win the, the raffle one, the second one, we're going to have a blind auction. If you don't win, keep your tickets right on the back of it saying, hey, what is your maximum amount that you want to pay for the very exclusive version of it? And the highest bidder wins again. Proceeds coming to the ACMS. So. Right. Um, at that, um, we'll, I guess we'll have a break for lunch. Um, yes, and do you think it's time to do the lunch break and get the barbecue going? Yes, please. Okay, great, yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, people. So, thanks for that.